Hey everyone, welcome back to the final episode of season two of The Rise. I am your host, Bridget Howard, and joining me today is the one and only Trey Wingo. Trey, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Bridge, did you just tell me I'm your closer? I'm like, I'm your Mariano Rivera for season you're, two? You're closing it out for season that's, two. That's a lot of pressure. So uh, <laughs> I wish you would have told me that beforehand. I'm a little nervous now because I obviously you're doing well. You're already into season two. So I'm just going to try and not screw it up. That's my job. I, I think you'll live up to the hype, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you grew up being a copy boy for your dad at Life Magazine before he later moved on to launch People Magazine. How yeah. early on was it that you began to feel that same creative itch that he had to pursue a career in journalism? You know, it's interesting. It sort of happened by osmosis. I mean, I never really had an aha moment, but but looking back at it, like I thought my dad, my dad's job was so much cooler than so many of my friends' uh, dad's jobs that were bankers or lawyers or businessmen. And I'm not saying that's not a fine and noble career, it just wasn't for me. And it absolutely, I think, shaped me in ways that I didn't even understand it at the time because I just thought it was fun to go do the things that I was out allowed to do with him. And I knew he loved it and he had a lot of fun about it and he got juiced about it and had a lot of energy. So I think it was never like explicit or over the top or it was just it was just it just sort of melded into who I was that I thought it was really cool that he what he what he did. I do remember and we might have talked about this before. Uh, when I started to do, you know, on air work, I said I want to, I want to do in TV what you did in print. Like I want to do that. And so that was what, when I got to that point in my life. That was sort of where I was with it. But it, it clearly affected me from the beginning because I can remember so many, you know, teacher and service days just going into to, on the train with him into New York and sort of whipping around uh, the Time Life building in, a, in an office chair with rollers on it, which I thought was the coolest thing in the world, taking this over there and doing that over there. It absolutely had an effect on me, no question. Well, you spent over two decades at ESPN. During your time there, you spent time as both a host for radio and TV. What are the differences between the way you handle yourself on both of those platforms? It's a great question. You, you're good. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it took a while. Like I, I'd done a lot of uh, fill-in radio stuff when I was doing the TV side, but I, I, I'll never forget this guy named Justin Craig who's still there now on the radio side. And he said, just remember when you're on radio, you have to constantly remind the listeners who you're talking to because <clears throat> first of all, it's, it's simulcast on ESPN or ESPN two. So, you know, that was obviously knowing it was on TV, but he's right. Like if you're on TV and you're, talking to someone, you introduce them, and then you just have a conversation. Well, someone tuning in on, you know, the, the Sirius XM or, you know, the local ESPN radio affiliate would not have that luxury. So if they tuned in halfway through the conversation, they would be like, who the hell is he talking to? So th the biggest difference for me was, was a procedural one. Like the content was going to be the content, whatever it was, but how to execute the content was the most important thing for me. And, and he said, we just remind the viewers, or the listeners rather, see, I said viewers again, remind the listeners every once in a while that, hey, this is who I'm talking to. Uh, and I did that, and I, I remember checking back with him months later. I said, is that working? I was like, you're doing it better than anybody right now. So I was very conscientious of that part of it on the radio side. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. I mean, you're telling stories, you're relaying information, you're trying to get great information out of guests. It's just a matter of how you go about doing it based on the medium being uh, an audio medium or a visual medium. I guess I never really thought about how with ESPN and the show that you did, Golik and Wingo, it was simulcast on both TV and right. radio at the same time. So yeah. how did you manage that? Uh, poorly. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, you know it, it is funny because whenever you're doing a TV show, you're very aware of the camera all the time. Like where, you know, that's why I say there's no such thing as a reality television show because there's no reality in it because you see the cameras. I mean, they're right there in front of you. You know, you can't pretend like they're not there. So you act a different way when you know a camera's in your face. Well, you know, we had a couple little cameras in the corners of the studios and they were cutting shots all that time. And it was different on the radio side. You never knew where the camera was or where you were gonna be on. And that did change things a little bit. So. That, that was the hardest part. Like when you're on TV, you know, you see the big camera with the tally light on it. And for those that don't know, the tally light is the red light that says 
this is the camera that we're pointing at. Don't mess up. <laughs> exactly. This is it. This is it. This is it. So you know. Well, on the radio side, you never really knew uh, and w- what what the camera was catching and what it wasn't catching. So that was that was a part of it that was a little different. It was just like, okay, just always be aware, but also don't worry about the camera, which was a little strange. One of the biggest takeaways that I took from you from the last time we talked was when you said being a good host is all about facilitating the best information out of the people that you work with. To young broadcasters who are wanting to get a hosting role, how do you do that? Well, listen, and and I want to be clear about what that's my opinion. Other people have different opinions about it. And, you know, I'm just not I'm not a hot taker. Like, I just don't throw things up the wall. Hey, let's see if this gets a rise out of people. You know, it's it's just not the way I operate, which is not to say that's not a bad way. It's just not the way I want to operate. I want to base everything on my information. Like, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Um, you know, a lot of people are making jokes on Twitter and Instagram about the receiving core for the Tennessee Titans. Now they have A.J. Brown and Julio Jones. And someone who I respect, actually, made a made a joke with here are the Titans wide receivers, which was a giant, awesome person. And here was their quarterback, Ryan Tannehill, who was a teeny little figure, you know. And I was like, actually, Ryan Tannehill, since he became the Tennessee Titans quarterback, has been bleeping amazing. Like, he's been top five in almost every category you want him to be in. They had the second best red zone offense uh, in 2020, a large part because of Ryan Tannehill. So, to me, the narrative should never be about someone's opinion unless that opinion is based on information, right? The information to me will always trump everything. And you can be creative in the way you share that information. And you can be humorous in the way you share that information. But if you throw something out there that's not true, like credibility is gained in years and lost in seconds, right? That, that That's the best way to look at it. And if you put something out there that is absolutely not true for a quick laugh or a joke, well, you're the joke because you messed it up and it's hard to regain that. So for me, and again, there are other people who feel very differently about this. And there are a lot of them that are very successful. If that's the way they want to live their lives, God bless them. It's just not the way I want to do it. Like if I say something, I want it to mean something because it's based on information. It's based on statistical analysis. It's based on a deep dive into the subject. That's important to me. And, and that's the way I, that's what I would encourage people to do. Because if you're just saying stuff to say stuff, eventually people will say, well, he's just saying that, you know, and or she's just saying that. Uh, and, and I don't think that's I don't think that's the way people would want to be perceived. I'm a big quote girl. So that quote you just dropped there is going to go in my back pocket or on a sticky note because I loved that. And, you know, it's not to say that you can't have an opinion, right? But you have to back it up with information. And I agree with you. The hot takers, a lot of times when you see it, it's like, really? Are you just going to like throw that out there? Like what? Back it up. Because information is everything in this industry. You got to know your content. So I think that's a great point that you made. On the rise, we really try to emphasize that every path is unique. Every path is different and, you know, just simply trust the process. And last year you moved on from ESPN and as you said, upset the apple cart. How did that change your outlook on your path in this industry? You know, it's interesting. And that's a really good question because when you're inside the machine and let's be honest, ESPN is a machine. When you're inside the machine, you have blinders and you're like, okay, this works. And I know this is how we do this and all this kind of stuff. But having sort of separated myself from it a little bit, I find myself looking at things very differently. Um, All the stuff that you really think matters a lot probably doesn't like it's look, I love sports. Don't get me wrong. It's fun, but it's not going to be the most important thing in my life ever. And I'm not sure it should be, you know, there are certain things that I care about in sports much more than other things. And that's my choice. That's my decision. But you, you get to this point where you realize, well, are, are we are we really saying something interesting or unique or expressing uh, an, an opinion or or a factoid that people don't know? Or are we just sort of feeding the wheel? Right. Like the little little gerbil wheel that you just get on. And, you, you, and it never running <laughs> because it keeps going around. And so it keeps running because it keeps going around. Like, you know, there are certain things that people out there will, you know, 
someone said, yes, I expect to be the quarterback after Ben Roethlisberger retires next year. Well, what else is he supposed to say? No, I suck. I'm terrible. I'm never going to be that quarterback. Like one of my favorite things about, after, like for example, after the draft, and if someone goes in the sixth or seventh round, and the coach or general manager will, will get a quote out there that says, "Yeah, we we uh, we expect him to really compete for a roster spot." Well, what else is he supposed to say? Yeah, he sucks. You know, we blew that. He can't play. So there needs to be a little bit of a filter in not just repeating what people tell you but disseminating what they tell you and what the value is in that, right? Like just because you get a quote from somebody that does, as my dog just walked in <laughs> in the background, hey, buddy, what's up? He's 14 and still going strong. Oh, um, my goodness. What's Dund- his name? Dunder. You get him Dunder. There he is. He's a boy. There you go. You know, chocolate lab. He's been around for a while. He smells the food. <laughs> Side note. I'm having my dinner as I'm talking to Bridget. It's multitasking. All day. Great multitasker. <laughs> I don't know if it's that or it's just really bad organizational skills. Those are both on the table. But like to me, just because somebody says something doesn't make it news, right? Like you there's a process that you have to go through. Okay, what is he saying? Why is he saying that? Or he or she? What are they trying to gain by saying that? And then you have to decipher that. Like that's not reporting, that's parroting. If you just regurgitate something that somebody tells you and that, well, they said this, well, why did they say this? What was the agenda they're trying to get across by leaking this information to me or to a bunch of people? There's clearly an angle they're trying to push. And I think that's something that sometimes gets lost in the immediacy of the media in social media right now. Well, hey, he said this, let's put it out there. But what does it mean? Like, what does it really mean? And that's been a part of this whole process for me uh, going away from it. Like, I can remember breathlessly running home. I just got a quote from this uh, starting quarterback. Let's put it out there. And, oh, great. Trey Wingo got this quote from this guy. But what does it mean? Like, what did it actually mean? Or is it just something to fill the void, you know? And I think that's that's something that's been a unique uh, about the last uh, nine or ten months for me in this process. You hosted the NFL Draft for numerous years on ESPN. Looking back, what are some of the biggest takeaways you got from covering that event? A couple of things. One, I love the draft because we we just had the reality television show discussion. It's the only true reality television show there is. Like, nobody knows. Like, uh, you know, you you know how much money you could have made in 2016 if you went to a Vegas bookie and said, hey, the top offensive lineman in the draft, right before he gets picked, there's going to be video of him smoking weed in a gas mask. You know, like you can't prepare for that. It doesn't happen. You know, the Vikings passed on a pick because they weren't, didn't get their pick in on time once in 2003. So the the uncertainty of it adds to the excitement of the event. Um, but the draft is also something that I, I took very seriously and still take very seriously. And I was happy to work with Fox this year on, on the social side with them on the draft because – especially if you're there for all three days, like you can't fake it. There's no way to fake when you know something about uh, like the Washington football team's receiver that was taken in the sixth round after Liberty in 2020, who was a juggler. Like you need to know that stuff, right? You need to, you need to put in the work. What I loved about the draft is it's a circus. Uh, it's an event. And I always tried to stress to people that everybody gets caught up on the first round picks, right? Oh, look at the shiny new thing. Well, most of your team is not a first round pick. Most of the draftees are are not. Most of your roster comes from the third through the seventh round and undrafted free agents. So I always tried to stress the importance of those days as much. Like you could have a terrible first round pick and still have a good draft based on what everyone else does. It's those diamonds in the rough, those gems that aren't the obvious choices that I think that that were most intriguing about it for me, and still to this day uh, are most intriguing about that for me. Like London Fletcher out of John Carroll University. Sure, why not? Uh, like he, he had one of the most amazing careers in the NFL that I can remember. Almost never missed a game, played a ridiculously long time, and was one of the leading tacklers almost every season he played. Uh, and he was a sixth or seventh round pick. Hell, he might have been even undrafted. I'm not even sure. But the point being, those guys, those stories, that's fun. That's the kind of stuff that makes the draft really interesting to me. Let's take a moment to talk about Sage, our sponsor for season two of The Rise. For many of us who are on air, finding pieces that are both stylish and affordable are sometimes hard to come by. 
This season, The Rise is sponsored by Sage, an online boutique that is dedicated to helping women find looks that help you accomplish your life goals while feeling confident and looking great. Use the code THERISE20 for 20% off your next purchase at shopsage.com and make sure to follow at shopsage on Instagram for updates on new arrivals and more. You joined the podcast game last fall with your own show, Half Forgotten History. What was your purpose in starting that? Um, because I knew so many stories that never made the air. The whole point, and we're continuing to do this, and we got season four. I mean, I'm I'm trying to get ahead of you. Like you're already through season two, so I got to. We're keep neck going. and neck. <laughs> got some catching up to do. You're, you're pushing me, so I got to keep going. Like season four is all about like little known stories, like or it's always been about that though. Like I, there are so many things that I heard from players and coaches that never made it on to NFL Live or the draft or Golik and Wingo for whatever reason that were told like in the green room before we're going on the air or uh, at a party at a Super Bowl over dinner, you know, when you could do that. It looks like we're headed back to that, which is really nice. And I know all this stuff and I know people would want to know this stuff. And, and that was the whole premise of it. There are a million different podcasts and that's fine. You can do whatever you want. What I'm trying to do is to let people behind the curtain a little bit and show them the things that they don't know. Like give you a couple of examples. We had Jeff Saturday on and he had, he told me forever when the Colts went to their first Super Bowl, Super Bowl 41, when they beat the bears 29 to 17 and Peyton was the MVP. Um, you know, Peyton knew like his legacy would be defined by whether or not he won a Super Bowl. He finally beat Tom Brady in the AFC championship game to get to one. And so he was like all business. And there was this giant team meeting with the Colts and like their families were there, their children were there. And Peyton got up and said, this is a business trip. I don't want to hear any crying babies on my floor. I don't want to hear kids or wives complaining. About and the wives are in the room. Like, and the kids are in the room. And Jeff said his wife started holding his hand so tight. She was choking the blood out of it. And Jeff went up to him and said, you need to chill out because we did this together and our family is a part of this and they're going to be a part, but you need to calm down or we're going to have a mutiny on our hands before we can get to the Super Bowl." So it, it's that kind of stuff that I want to share with everybody that I've been very fortunate enough to know and people have told me over the years and they're very comfortable with telling those stories now. And, and that's the part of it that's a lot of fun for me. You have to be able to cultivate those meaningful relationships in this industry. And it seems as though your podcast is heavily based on those relationships that you've created. And that's another point that we really stress on the rise because relationships get you far in this industry. What would you stress to young broadcasters when it comes to relationship building? Well, again, build them carefully and build them over long term. I mean, I appreciate you saying that. Like, for example, you know, we're uh, a lot of those guys told me stories because they trusted me and they trusted me that I would I would tell that information in the right way. And like, this is not stuff that I, you know, you don't meet someone for the first time and then get their complete uh, personal background and information. They, they share that with you and some of these funny things when they trust you to be a caretaker of that information. Uh, another, another great one was, uh, I, and again, I'm, I'm going Manning heavy here and I apologize, but you know, Tim Hasselbeck, and I worked together for years on NFL Live, and he was the he was the third quarterback in the room for Eli's rookie year with Kurt Warner and uh, and Eli. And there was a game where their starting left tackle broke his leg, and the backup was a guy named Bob Whitfield, who played for years in the NFL, and was a very good player. But this was at the back end of his career, and he was sort of hanging on. Well, he came in and was terrible; just was had an awful game. Like gave up five sacks. Eli got hit a million times his rookie year, and then they had a team meeting after that loss, and. He got up there and said, hey, man, that loss is on me. Luke, who was a starting tackle, Luke never played, never gets hurt. I didn't think he was. So I was out all night partying. I didn't get any sleep. I was doing things I shouldn't have done. Basically, he was saying, you know, the night before a game, he was out drinking and partying and didn't sleep a wink. And Eli turned to Tim and said, and I'm the bust? Like, And, and we told that story with Eli and Archie, and it was great. And And Eli laughed, and Archie laughed about it. And it's that kind of stuff. Like they trust me that I would gonna I was gonna say that in the right way and, and sort of frame it in the right way. But those stories are great. Like those are the things that get me going. Like we're pretty soon we're gonna have an episode with Steve Smith. We're gonna talk about a 
a run and he had with a former teammate who was then playing for the Patriots named Jermaine Wiggins. And I mean, it got real in a hurry. Like they were ready to, and Steve Smith does not play. Like if he's going to go down that road, as he said to me, either I'm sending your family a bouquet or you're sending my family a bouquet. I mean, like he, there was no, he wasn't half assing it. He was going all the way. It's a great story. It's on a season four episode coming up a little later this summer. You'll really enjoy it. You mentioned that when you are trusted by these players and coaches and people that you interview that you do, you have to take a heavy responsibility and they trust you in the way that you're going to say it and that you're going to say it accurately. How have you been able to manage being like your funny side, but also being serious when telling those stories? Because there is kind of a fine line and you want to be taken seriously, but also add that fun element to it. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And I'm sure there's some people that, that have, I've, I've, look, I'm 100% sure there's some people that have taken that the wrong way. But for the most part, my relationships with all the people in the NFL, including people in the, in the front office of the NFL and teams in the NFL and players in the NFL has been great. And, and to me, that was like, I can't tell you the number of people that I heard from in the league when I left ESPN that I was not expecting to hear from. I mean, like, DMs from players and texts from general managers that I had maybe had a casual sort of, you know, uh, relationship with or a casual sort of meeting with them. And they felt compelled to send something to me. That meant a lot to me because that part of it, again, goes back to the trust factor and the credibility thing. Like you may not like something that we do or that we did, but you know that we did it with the best of intentions or we did it with the way that was trying to use, there are many things that we, like we'll, we did this thing with Damian Woody once where, you know, it's funny as a former first round player, first round pick of the Patriots and was on a couple of Super Bowl wins for them. He finished his career with the Jets and he has a real aversion to the Jets and he just feels very tied to them. And, you know, the Jets were terrible over the last few years. And we did this Jets therapy session where he was on the couch. He's like, I, I need to let this go. I can't handle it. You know, but it was based in the context of what it was like to be a Jets fan and how bad they've been. So we tried to frame it in the right way. You could easily, if you're a Jets player, a Jets fan, say you're taking a shot at our team. But then we're like, well, actually, we're just being honest about what we're, what's happening, you know. So it, it is a fine line. And, and I'm sure I've crossed it a couple of times. And I'm sure there are some players and some coaches that aren't real happy with it. But I can say for the most part, uh, every relationship that I had over those years of doing NFL Live and the draft and NFL primetime for 15 years uh, have withstood the test of time. And, and that's that's something I'm, I'm more proud of than almost anything else. It is time to round things out for this last episode of season two of The Rise with Quick Hits, my favorite part of the episode. Are you ready? So I'm ready, Let's to go. reveal the true Trey Wingo to our listeners. <laughs> First question for you. I know you are a big golf guy. So yeah. what is your favorite course to play? Oh, that's like picking your favorite child, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so many. Um, I just got back from a trip actually in Wisconsin called Sand Valley and Mammoth Dunes, which blew me away. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I love Cabot up in uh, up in Nova Scotia. Pinehurst is always a great one. But I've been very fortunate to play Cypress Point in Monterey, California, four or five times. And that might be the best walk in golf. It's it, There's so much history there. And it's just – Cypress Point is hard to beat. It's it's hard to beat. You have covered a lot of event, events in your career. But if you had to choose one that you still have on your bucket list, what would it be? Interestingly enough, it's the Masters. Uh, I've covered every other major in golf. Uh, I've covered every major in tennis. I've covered NBA Finals, World Series, Super Bowls, Stanley Cup playoffs. I've never, ever covered the Masters. So, uh, look, I, I'm my plate is full, right? I did, I've done the Olympics. I've done all this kind of stuff. But, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get to Augusta one day and, and be there for all of that. that. That would probably be the one I would check off. It would just make sense, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. like, I mean, three fourths of the way there. I might as well finish the thing. I mean, guys, come on. Someone call up Trey. Get him to cover the Masters. It's super easy. <laughs> what is your favorite book? Well, uh, there's a couple of them. Uh, one of them is called A Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving. It was made into a really bad movie called Simon Birch, which starred uh, Jim Carrey. But it, it, the premise of this movie, uh, the premise of the book, 
it's about this little guy who sort of was against, uh, had all the things going against him and found a way to, to have an impact in, in his life. Uh, it's A Prayer for Owen Meany is a very, very good book. There's also a great book I, I read 20 years ago called One Year Off. It was about a, a guy who had a very successful business and his kids were like in their, I think between eight and 13. And they decided, you know what? Let's just take a year off and like just escape. And they traveled the globe for a year. And they all they went to all these different countries. And it ended up being like 16 to 17 months instead of a year. But it was called One Year Off from the Grind. And the things that they learned and explored and, and were able to do as a family was incredible. And then when they got back, they realized all the stuff they thought was important really wasn't that important. And half the stuff they thought they needed, they didn't need anymore. Now, again, it's a it's a thing that you can do when you've been successful and you've had a, a you have money. I mean, let's not pretend like it doesn't matter. But I thought it was a really cool experience that they decided to do as a family. And I really like that. We'll base the next question off that. Uh, what is your favorite travel destination to go to with your family? Well, uh, we've been to Hawaii a bunch. Um, I love it out there. And uh, I'll never stop going there. I've, I've never gone out there and said, boy, this was terrible. We should never <laughs> do this again. Um, my mom and dad and, and took all of us to uh, Tuscany a, a few years, which was great. But I got to tell you, Australia is absolutely amazing. And uh, we, we went there a few years ago, and I, would, I can't wait to go back and bring everybody with us. Um, and there's still so many other places I want to go, right? Like I've never been to the Maldives. I've never been to Greece. I want to go to Athens and Santorini and Mykonos and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I am a, I'm very much a traveler and very much an adventurer. And I, I'm always looking for the next thing to say, hey, this was great. And now I want to see what I've never been to South Africa. I'd love to go to uh, Cape Town. I've heard it's just wonderful. So uh, I, th those are things that are on my on my bucket list. But Australia was amazing. And Hawaii, Maui is just incredible. Last question for you. What is your go to karaoke song? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I have not <clears throat> done karaoke in a while, but, you know, there's a, a really long song called American Pie by John <laughs> McLean that came out. If you if you draw that when you're up there for a while and people start throwing shit at you. <laughs> uh, but that that one is fun. Um, I, you know, that's a really good question. Like, I haven't done a good karaoke in a long time. Don't Stop Believing by Journey would probably be way up there. Uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of them that I would – happily belt out without a care in the world. But uh, those are some of the first ones that come to mind. I Mine's always Sweet Caroline because everyone oh. sings Everyone sings with hands, you. So you're not actually hands, scary. Reaching out, <laughs> touching me, touching you. Good one. Good one. Good. And everyone just sings along with you. So the pressure is off of you. It's great. So maybe that's your next one. There it is. It's on, <laughs> it's on the rotation. Well, Trey, it is always such a pleasure getting to talk with you. I so appreciate you coming on the rise today. And I can't wait to see what you accomplish next, where you travel to next. The, the world is your oyster, as they say. <laughs>